Hey, thanks for tuning in to It's a Guy Thing podcast. I'm today's uh, special guest, Anthony, and with me are these three other cowards. Rick, Mario, and Michael. And now, in front of four people, and maybe three people listening to the podcast, it's time to get it on. Oh, yeah. Oh Lord! Damn! All right, Pat Smear. I'm okay, a little hungry. So try this. <laughs> Pat Smear. I don't want to talk. Pat Smear was a wrestler before he was in Nirvana. A was he? He wrestled with the Mexican League. I thought he just wrestled wow. with the demons. Lucha Libre. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he wrestled with Kurt for the for the drugs. <laughs> anyway, flashback to the last to the Kurt Cobain episode. Hey, so what's the Montreal screw job? <laughs> wow, uh, we're just gonna jump right in, huh? No, yeah. no, because so like we're, we're we were kind of talking about um, wrestling, mm-hmm. and me personally, I don't know anything about wrestling except very, very scant, scatological. So when you say Rick that you don't know anything about when you say you don't know anything about wrestling, we're first we're talking about not like uh, collegiate wrestling. We're talking about the entertainment wrestling, WWF, WWE, all that, right? Yeah, because I know everything about Greco-Roman, so okay. I don't need to talk about that. Right, I want right. to talk yeah, about that. Yeah, because when he's all in it. Yeah, I know A.C. Slater is your, your big hero. So that's, <laughs> that, that's where I, it ends and begins, right is, there. Is A.C. – he's not a man. Gotta beat man. Valley. Gotta beat Valley. No, yeah, but – That's right. <laughs> so when I say – uh, Medic. When I say Hulk Hogan. Hogan, you know who I'm talking about. Yes. Co- about Kurt, Kurt Cobain. Kurt Co- Hogan, what? Hulk Hogan. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Kurt Cobain Hogan. Hulk Hogan? Yeah. Oh, yes. okay. his finishing yeah. move is yeah. uh, yeah. so I, I, shotgun I, to the I head. I know very like basic oh. stuff. Like I know some of those. I know a lot of names, but not like all the stories and the biographies attached to. Them. Did you watch it as a kid? Uh, I would watch. You know, what was the one that would show like on Saturday nights, like late. This is when we were like kids. Mm. So, oh, I mean, they had the old Saturday Night Main Event. It was probably like that. It was like that, NBC. That's, that's what I would see. So, like, just pieces of stuff. Like, I never like. Uh, did like the when WrestleMania would come to town? I know like a lot oh, of yeah. friends and stuff. People would go to that. I never did that. I, I I I it was entertaining to watch, but I just never got into it on that level. When did you grow out of it? Huh? When did he you never grow, grow into it? it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I oh, never yeah, I never, never grew into it. Like it just wasn't something. Like it was never something I hated. I just it wasn't the thing that I got into at that particular time. You yeah. Know what I mean? But like, so we we're talking about it, and like obviously you guys have your your. Uh, your knowledge of the subject is a lot, you know, deeper than, than I'm an mine, aficionado. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, exactly. A so, aficionado. so like in, in looking up some of this stuff, like to talk to you about, I, I was coming across things that I'm interested in, which is like conspiracy and stuff. And I'm sure. like very pleased and excited. Now I'm a little more interested because there's plenty of wrestling conspiracies. <laughs> oh, if, that I'm coming if, you, if you like take away the, the fascia of, of professional wrestling, just like you take the fascia away from any type of in, uh, entertainment entity, uh, entity, you're going to find a lot of scandal underneath it. And wrestlers are no different. In fact, it's a very cutthroat kind of business. And this era and what it led to was the Montreal screw, uh, screw job was basically um, the two chief companies uh, in wrestling at the time in the U.S. were WWF, which at that point in time was already the tried and true number one brand standard. And it was losing ground in a big way to WCW, an upstart that came about – uh, in the very late 80s to early 90s, depending on when you define when contracts went through. It was really complicated. Mm-hmm. But anyways, these but there two, were two separate companies. Yes, right? there were two separate companies. And in, in this case, the old standard was losing big. Right. And that's and Vince was, McMahon's company? Yes. That's Did Vince Ted McMahon's. Turner own the other one? Who Ted Turner's was WCW. See, I don't know why Microsoft. I know that. Exactly. So Microsoft yeah. Computers versus Apple, right? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so in this particular case, <laughs> what happened was is that um, Ted Turner had basically – Opened up his his uh, immense checkbook uh, to um, lure stars from WWF to uh, WCW to make their brand. Mm-hmm. Well, as they were doing this, um, again, uh, w- uh, WWF was uh, dealing with a lot of different uh, internal strife. Uh, they had uh, Vince McMahon himself had already dealt with several cases with the federal government about certain antitrust laws, also with the steroid cases. And things like that. So his brand had already taken a big hit in the public eye. And so as they did this, what happened was is that as they're luring stars, they started um, taking away, you know, revenue from the WWF. 
by taking their stars and also just, again, they, they're just pumping in tons of money to make this brand. Well, eventually, uh, WWF found it hard to keep one of their longest, most respected stars, his name was Bret Hart, mm -hmm. uh, to keep him happy because basically uh, he had a certain contract that was already uh, signed that uh, w uh, they say that Vince McMahon was unable to fulfill. So he started basically going over to WCW to see if he could maybe uh, get a deal that, that would benefit him. He eventually got the deal, and in a certain arrangement, he had asked um, both WCW and WWF if he could retain the title for a certain er for a certain time until at such time he would be able to um, drop the title, meaning lose it, mm -hmm. in, in a fashion that he felt befitted him. So he's kind of an egomaniac in this respect. So, well, so Anthony, mm -hmm. real quick, um, because it's really awesome having a guest on that has a pure empirical and fanatical knowledge about it. Because you're as much educated in wrestling as you are an absolute fan, right? Mm -hmm. And and of course, both of us, you know, I, I grew up being a fan as a kid, and then you know, uh, even through uh, late high school and right in early college was kind of the the pinnacle apex of my fandom before I kind of just. T teeter, teetered off or whatever, but when you were talking about arranging for him to lose his title, mm -hmm. or whatever, that's kind of the big thing. People that don't know a lot about the the business, I guess, is the sure. best way to call it. Because some people get upset when you say sport, although I, you know, that's a debatable thing itself. But exactly, <laughs> but uh, the the business of of wrestling entertainment, every single match, even the most basic entry level match that might be televised or not, every single one of them, the outcome is predetermined is that right for the most part yes i would say like 99.9 .9 of every match <laughs> is predetermined so when we talk about this person being a star or this person being you know a a jobber mm -hmm. which is what someone that's just kind of a they basically enhance the other talent they always lose and make the other uh person look good oh, okay so who decides like in the in the scope of it who's going to be big riser and who's going to be one of those guys ultimately it's it's the booker and the booker is basically the matchmaker they're the ones who determine uh who goes who wins and who loses uh who they start putting on a push meaning su sustained victories and eventually you know try right, to get fame. uh yeah, exactly they're trying to get uh fan support for this person because they feel that they can make a lot of money off of this person well it's it's basically one person uh in wwf it's always been vincent man he's the final say on everything he determines who wins who loses how they lose uh, basically, he controls your career. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this particular case, uh, Bret Hart, which, again, that was that, that champion, was the benefactor uh, of Vince uh, pushing him for a, almost a now at that point uh, about five years straight. Uh, lost very few matches, uh, was, a, was a champion on multiple, on multiple occasions. Um, and, 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 this, and while we always say that... Uh, like, of course, a pr promoter can decide whether or not to make you a star. A lot of it has to do also on whether or not you can actually ex exhibit skill in the ring. Right. Because we can, of, of course, push someone who's big and has bulging biceps and physically looking. They look so impressive. But once they get into the ring, you know, two moves in, they're already winded. Mm -hmm. Or they, or they're just sloppy. You know, it, there's actually a great deal of physicality and a great deal of um, physical skill that is required to do this. So that that's the that's kind of like the the science of of wrestling, you know, because you're talking about a lot of the the behind the scenes stuff that goes into the preparation and how technically skilled some of these guys are versus how much time they simply spend in the gym to look good and get mm. spray bottled yeah. before they come out with the with the water and, the, the and all oil. that stuff. <laughs> but from your point of view, just for people listening that you know might be huge fanatics that like to have the opportunity to defend their fandom, or the mm -hmm. people that don't know anything about it. If the outcomes are predetermined, because that's always the thing people always get crazy about, like, oh, it's fixed, it's a waste of time, oh, it's fixed, it's so <laughs> stupid, and it's like, wrestling's fake, wrestling's fake. That's always been the big thing that turns people off. So from your point of view, why is wrestling entertainment a compelling entity with those things from the detractors? Well, in this case, I think when people say, like, okay, once it's, it's predetermined, it's fake, I think that's kind of... Um, that's the argument that we used to use when we were like 10 years old. Uh, the thing mm -hmm. is, is that you have it all wrong. This isn't about sport. 
if you want sport, well then by all means, you know, go get yourself, uh, go watch a, a baseball game or go watch basketball. In this case, uh, wrestling, in in my in my opinion, is uh, a hybrid, if you will, of both entertainment, spectacle, and athletic ability. In that respect, you might say it's almost like a gymnastics competition, because while it is routine, uh, while of course uh, now in that case you could certainly say that you could have a score like you have judges, but you can also have exhibitions. Mm-hmm. And so in this particular case, you're uh, not only are they trying to uh, package a great routine, but they also are you know trying to look good. Of course, they have these flashy outfits. They try to get the right kind of music to set everything off. Well, in that same respect. Wrestling is, uh, you're talking about physical ability, and so physical, like, if you want to make it at the most base, stunt work. Mm-hmm. It's hard hitting. It's legitimate. Because uh, if you actually hit, like uh, Michael hit that, uh, that uh, <laughs> microphone, yeah. um, in this case, what happens is, is that if DDT'd you try to... My, um, <laughs> my mic. Uh, anyone who actually steps into a real ring, they always think that they have this uh, misnomer thinking that it's like some sort of trampoline. I've... I've actually taken a bump, meaning like you actually fall in the ring, mm-hmm. and everyone falls. The first time they fall, they forget to like protect their chin. So the first thing that happens is that they fall on their back, their head whips back because you're basically landing onto plywood. Hmm. So this is not gentle. Yeah. And so in this case, like anyone who actually is willing to do wrestling has to have a modicum of physical ability and also uh, stamina and endurance and durability because they got to do this many times. All yeah. over the year, all over the world, and get very little rest. And so that's one thing is the athletic ability. The other side is the drama. At the best, the best kind of uh, wrestling matches, they tell a story. They they call what it's called ring psychology, meaning that we we script the match almost like as if a story was happening. Uh, meaning that we don't just throw moves together; the moves make sense. So if I'm starting to work the uh, like in a good psychology uh, aspect, if I'm working your leg, meaning that if I'm actually applying moves to it. Well, later down the road, your leg should be hurt. And mm-hmm. so that gives way to other possibilities in the match. Maybe oh, a move okay. that I would normally use, and I'm, if I'm properly selling the leg, meaning I'm demonstrating that it's hurt, if I try to do that move, maybe my leg falters, and that creates some sort of crazy finish. Gotcha. Okay, so those things can be layered on, and it creates a real story in the fight. Again, in movies, you have that all the time. Little opportunities are created in the fight, which actually which – actually, lead to where the conclusion actually went to. Right. And so that's where the best fights happen. And that's and that's a part of ring psychology. On top of that, you also have drama. That means that the best workers also talk about like they have promos, which means their their speeches. Um this is their t- uh, time to communicate directly with you the fan. And in this case, they're trying to make you believe in them, you know, in the character if you will. Hmm. And kind of like a politician. Exactly, <laughs> kind of. In this particular case what what's happening is is that what they're trying to do is create it so that you you know you're either rooting for them or you're rooting against them, and so it's it's all designed so of course that you pay to you know to go to the arena and watch the show. Well, in this case, uh, at their at their best, they create a sense of drama. It's almost like soap opera, and so these are all different aspects, and it takes a very different type of skill set to create a very good wrestler because you have to have all these things. A, hmm? a very specific <laughs> skill set. Oh well, that's the thing is that it's it's very different. It's it well in this case like you have to have specialize in certain things. But and the thing is is that no one else in any other uh, type of endeavor does this. We've had yeah. plenty of professional athletes come in and they're terrible. We've had plenty of professional actors come in and they're terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it takes you know you have to be a little bit of everything to do this, and so that's why I like it. Is that at its best, it's art. At its worst, it's terrible. So, so let me ask you this, <laughs> and, awesome. and I say this again as, as an outsider to, to that particular sport: mm-hmm. is, in your opinion, um, what's the your average? Describe to me your average wrestling fan. <laughs> um, well, I guess I, I mean I'm not a sociologist, but in this particular case, I would say that your average wrestling fan uh, tends to be. Well, it's funny because now wrestling fans are getting older. Mm-hmm. Um, and this has to do with perhaps the wrestling industry not doing a good job of capturing, capturing the imagination you. of the young. Yeah. Um, this also has to do with a lot of people who are just nostalgic. Uh, the big, the biggest wrestling boom occurred basically in the 80s and 90s. And, of course, naturally those fans are getting older now. 
And so some of them have stayed on, like myself. Uh, but I think that in this case, um, you know, we're we're at we're we're where we at, and uh, really not much to it. It's yeah. you know. Uh, um, I ask because, and I, and I wonder, you know, um, they they really run the whole gamut. Um, I wonder because you know, growing up again, like we were talking about earlier, <laughs> like I remember seeing the on Saturday nights or whatever, like seeing wrestling and. Yeah, there was always those bumpers where you have like them talking jump to each mm-hmm. other, and then they show a fight, and mm-hmm. you know, and there's a there was a whole obvious, uh, obviously a theatricality to it, and there was a, a structure, and you know, all it was that like soap opera. And, mm-hmm. But but it's like but it's like you could kind of again, even as a casual like watcher of it, like an observer, you kind of knew. Like I said, I, somehow randomly, I, I can think of people's names that I remember, mm-hmm. and little like tidbits of information, and who was you know, an enemy of so-and-so and who was so-and-so's girlfriend, things like that. Mm -hmm. Because it was, you know, in a very, I guess, you know, intelligently way, intelligent way, it was, it was fed to you. You know, you were told this is the bad guy. This is the good guy. This is their beef. And now you get to see it in action when they fight and whenever, Mm -hmm. and you get to like test all those, you know, um, kind of little dramas and Mm -hmm. the alliances of that. And I, I wonder now in this kind of, obviously, you know, something we keep coming back to is digital age. It's something that's, that's a little more, um, uh, it's, it's something that's not as impressive anymore in the sense that we're, you know, you have professional sports, like, you know, other professional sports Mm -hmm. like football or basketball where you are constantly barraged with drama, but for, as far as we know, it's real drama. Sure. You know, so, so Mm -hmm. now, you know, uh, 20 years ago, unless you're reading Sports Illustrated or you had access to you know, what ESPN or something where they're actually talking to specific athletes, you really didn't know a lot about your favorite athletes you know, unless you really, really sought that information. Whereas now you can follow your favorite athlete on Twitter or on TMZ right, mm-hmm. or on Facebook or whatever, and you have access to their story, right? Sure. And and that's the thing. I I I guess that's why I'm asking about that now. Like, what appeals to a, a a major fan of wrestling now, as opposed to a fan of another sport, where you're still fed that same type, sort of drama. I mean, you look at like the NFL draft, for example, it happened last week. You know, you see like the Johnny Manziel thing, where that's a whole like. I mean, it had this arc of you know a a, a narrative mm-hmm. yeah. because it's like, oh, this guy is this kind of you know, um, divisive guy where people love him or people hate him and where is he going to go? And you almost want to go somewhere just to see, you know, what happens. And, and, and there's this whole drama. And, and, and again, like the media feeds into that. And, sure. and I'm sure like, you know, maybe retrospectively, like down the road, people look back to pres- professional wrestling and, and realize that might have been the trigger for a lot of the stuff we see now where, mm-hmm. you know, the media been able to pump stuff up and create stories kind of out of thin air. Right. With – you know, people were real people or whatever. So that, that that's why I ask because I think it's a really interesting thing now. Where you know, as even someone that might say, "Well, I don't really like wrestling," mm-hmm. but at the same time, as viewers of these other sports, we're still kind of pulled into the same drama, which is like, "Oh, what did like Johnny Manziel say? Oh, he's hanging out with Drake and oh, blah blah." You know, whatever. <laughs> and it's the same thing, right? Like right. it's gossipy, it's it's raggy. You know, mm-hmm. like so. Well, yeah, and th- and that's the thing about wrestling is that it's uh, in many respects the best angles or storylines, if you will. Um, those kind of draw from reality. The best ones are, you know, like you say, a Johnny Manziel. Some people see him as a good guy. Some people see him as a bad guy. Well, in this particular case, you can do that same kind of gimmick, or th- that's the kind of character that you would create. It happens all the time for those types of wrestlers, where they. To, you know, they try to make some sort of MVP kind of character, mm. and um, they're signing to the biggest agent or what have you. In this case, um, wrestling draws from all sorts of influences, you know, in entertainment to make another star. Um, again, for myself, again, I'm speaking for only in my opinion. I'm not. I, I mean, I like the flashiness, I like the the drama, but my thing is the physicality. I like the idea of people being able to work coherently in the ring. Um, I guess because, you know, I just I've watched so many matches that it's it takes a lot to impress me. Mm-hmm. But when you do, I'm I'm sold. Yeah. And so that's my thing. But again, of course, angles and characters, those do a lot to drive new fans. Yeah. And here the thing is, is that you know, like you take a look at like MMA, or um, or if you take a look at kickboxing or uh, baseball or basketball, those things a lot of times. And I love all the sports, 
but you can watch um, on any given Sunday on, a, on for NFL, mm-hmm. and you can watch out of the you know the eleven planned games for that weekend. You might have like <laughs> thanks, Mike. <laughs> and uh, out of the eleven planned games you have that Sunday, you have like nine blowouts. So you have a, like you know basically eighteen different uh, franchises with with fans who kind of just got bored for yeah. three hours. Yeah. The thing about wrestling is is that at their best they're able to make you excited on every single match. Uh, right. That is because it is uh, fictitious. And, yeah, because yeah. we're yeah. designing it to it, make it. Because you're 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 creating the drama. You're, you're creating, creating the, the competition, and, and, and it's creating the fact that you will always have something yeah. gripping. So is is the inherent knowledge of fans. That it is a scripted sport. Well, mm-hmm. There it, are is, fans is, that, that, that don't think that, though. There are fans that, that are out there that are that like, That is so, real. like, yeah, th- that's is so. Is that a myth? Th- that's, the, yeah, the, I should have been <laughs> on the last episode. <laughs> um, no, that's, the, yeah, that's a. In this case, like you, you were saying about TMZ and social media, uh, pretty much everybody knows wrestling is what it is. Um, but in this case, that's what, again, I also know that Thor didn't really beat Loki. Right. You know, right. I also know that that the people in in uh, in my soap operas don't actually kill each other or knock people off the cliff. Or so whatever. you're saying if it's done well, there's there's a there's a suspension of disbelief. Where exactly. You, you accept it. You say, I know it's fake, but as long as it's entertaining me, as long as it's exciting, mm-hmm. like you say, as long as it's keeping you entertained. Exactly. Then if you're absorbed by the by the characters it. and the storyline, if you take it for what it is, if you accept the premise that you have mm-hmm. this wrestling league with guys of different walks of life and different uh you know flamboyant personalities and you allow and you at least keep that away from everything else out of outside of reality mm-hmm. and accept it for what it is i think you find a lot of enjoyment out of it yeah but then again that's just like anything i mean if 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 i'm a movie buff and i know exactly how each stunt is done or i know oh well you know the the script wouldn't accept uh this person to get killed at this point cuz i know all the movie tropes yeah. at this point you kind of take your you're, you're kind of um, shortchanging yourself in getting some yeah. some fun out of it. So so is, is, I imagine that's probably then you know one of the lasting um, really positive a- attributes of, of wrestling is that, like you said, even though people know it's scripted, even though they know it has those qualities, the fact that they're still able to to keep connecting to it. Mm-hmm. After this long is is obviously a testament to the thing. Like sure. you said, you you see interviews with like um, actors or directors or whatever people that make movies, and they're like, "Oh, I don't watch movies anymore because it's just ruined. Now that I'm in movies, it's ruined." Which yeah. is like sounds like it's always such a dick's head thing to say, but <laughs> yeah. you get it because they're like they're probably watching it and going, "Oh, well, you know that light's weird or that person delivered that wrong," and they're they're constantly mm-hmm. judging it. And we all do that. I mean, sure. no matter what it is. But again, like you're saying. People are able to let go of that and say, "Okay, well, as long as I'm entertained, I don't care," mm-hmm. which isn't a bad thing. I mean, I'm, no, by no yeah. means. Well, you know? I mean, that's why we watch movies or we do we yeah. do entertainment for the first place. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, a, it's one of those things when you watch, you know, like I said, football on a Sunday, where you know after your game's over, you know, like me, I like the Texans, and after you know they that's play a lot in, of disappointment. You know, <laughs> after they play at noon, it's like. I have to go, okay, now at 3.30, like, what game's on? Mm-hmm. And part of that is determined by whether or not I watch it is determined by the matchup, um, the matchup mm-hmm. which is exactly the same thing, or the night game. And that's the same thing. They schedule the primetime games because that has the most drama. It's Eli versus Peyton or exactly. you know, uh, Peyton versus Tom Brady or whatever, and it's built in. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? it's Obviously, it's not necessarily scripted, but in a way it is. It's, it's Well, it's human in, drama. Yeah. 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 And mm-hmm. it's playing out on the field. So and, has it always been that way? Pretty much, like, like I mean, from the get go, was it like, hey, was it was it ever just the sport of it of people wrestling? Um, pretty much for the longest time. Um, I mean, since the 1900s, uh, I mean, they decided at, at, there were still shoot matches, uh, meaning that matches were uh, legitimate. Mm-hmm. Uh, shoot matches had occurred in the like 1910s, 20s, and starting to grow in rarity, you know, 30s and so on. But eventually, then they decided that and this was always. Even professional wrestling in the 1800s, when it was just starting off as a carny act, excuse me, was um, all based uh, on like it was a work, theatrics, meaning that or... well, not only theatrics, but really it's it's a it's a work, meaning that we're trying to suck you in so that we can take your money. Mm, okay. uh, the gimmick way back when was is that they would try to you know again this is a carnival circuit where you would have um, a fledgling person they called them a journeyman and. They would basically say, "Okay, pay your, you know, five dollars or ten dollars, and take him on, 
and if you beat him, we'll give you uh, X amount of dollars. Mm-hmm. You beat the next guy, you you get an, uh, more money. Right. And eventually, the, it was always built in that yeah, you could have like all these strong farm boys who, who could certainly beat the journeyman. So they sucked them in to now face the next person and the next person and the, always the last person, which is the biggest money was given. Mm-hmm. Uh, like if you've seen Spider Man, y'all remember yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like that. We're oh, all comers. Yeah. Exactly. All uh, all comers. But in this case, this was legitimate. Yeah. And the last person was always called a hooker, meaning someone who could actually <laughs> right. crip, uh, who could cripple you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so these were the worst guys. And so they would basically hook you in a submission. Hmm. And so that was – this was always built on making money right. and kind of grifting people. Yeah. Interesting. And so the thing was is that eventually it stopped – it ceased being shoots. Um, back then, uh, these were not – it was not very odd to see uh, technical bouts where you would actually have like hour-long, two-hour-long, three-hour-long bouts wow. of guys wrestling, again, for real. Um it was it was then when crowds started getting tired of it and dwindling mm-hmm. that uh you know what now we have to kind of uh, uh up things well, well we have to kind of like um manufacture the drama mm-hmm. so we have to find a way to hook people in and once they started doing that and people started cooperating with each other you know it was off to the races cuz then uh you started getting in uh television and it was you know wrestling has always been a cheap form of very easy entertainment to make and so mm-hmm. uh since then, it's always been a work, uh, meaning that yeah. it's been staged. See, because I got into it back in like when I was a kid. Like uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, like Andre the Giant mm-hmm. and and uh, Hulk Hogan. And what was that guy? Like he looked like a beetle, bald head, <laughs> and he had a, that like flames on the side or something. Oh, like that. Um, Bam, 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 Bam Bigelow. Bigelow. Bam Bam Bigelow. Thank you. <laughs> that's right. Like like that's that's when I like was interested in it, and then like very quickly afterwards was like uh, don't care anymore. <laughs> but like how like. I, I find it like I, I'm this whole time the beginning half of this I'm like listening and I'm like just hypnotized because I never gave it that much thought right you know to me it was just it was entertainment when I was a kid and then it was a passing thought later on mm-hmm. um, it's just it, to me it's just fascinating to hear to hear all of the intricacies that go on behind the scenes that I was like I assumed that it was there once I found out that it was mm-hmm. wasn't real but like to that depth it was just yeah. amazing. There's a, there's an immersion. I think there's an immersion quality to it that is identical to like watching a great movie for two hours, where you're in the theater, and you're in the dark, and for that moment in time, you're in Gotham yeah. with Wayne, and you're dealing with his issues the same way, and you're emotionally connected to all of that. And I think, you know, for me, that's what's you know, while I don't I don't watch it weekly or anything like that anymore, but. I still kind of out of the corner of my eye keep an eye on the sport itself because I'm still kind of vested in it and I still know the majority of who the people are and, you know, every now and then I'll catch a, a large event or something like that. And I've always told, you know, I've always told, you know, some of my friends, you know, that kind of like my, my issue with like boxing as well is sort of like while the business of wrestling is not hurting for fans, it's not hurting for money, it's doing very well. I like to think of myself as kind of like a, uh, a litmus test for you know how it's going not because i'm the end all be all just because i'm sort of a universally open-minded person i feel like if i'm not jumping on board with it then maybe it's not doing all it could to catch mm-hmm. the, the casual fan not yeah right. and and because i'm not really kind of a niche guy i'm sort of a universal oneg type person where you know if you you compel me i'm there if the story's good i'm gonna play you know this specific video game or i'm gonna watch this specific sport or see this type of movie or listen to this certain song. So like my thing with, with wrestling is sort of like back when it was, you know, the Hulk Hogan days, it was always about these characters. And, you know, as kids, we could be like, this is a good guy. This is a bad guy. And then it sort of that, that lost its, its, uh, its flavor. And I remember that big Vince McMahon thing on TV when he came out and he sort of just put it all out there. He sort of ended the era of the innocent, you know, what was it, the Hulk Hogan thing, the take your vitamins and mm-hmm. say your prayers at night and all that stuff. He sort of ended that era and ushered in this new era of we're going to be edgy. We're going to start showing, you know, sex sells type stuff. And we're going to start, you know, pushing the envelope. And we're going to have guys, you know, flicking off the camera and censoring it and just giving this whole other edgy part to it that now we're basically saying it's not kids anymore. Now the money, because now kids don't have to beg their parents for the money that we need. Those kids are now adults that have their own money. They can spend it now. And like like Anthony was saying, they've gotten older and the nostalgia has kept them going. They're they're not hurting for, for business. But at the same time, I would love to see the business of wrestling 
respected a little bit more. Like you'll never see a wrestling match outcome reported in ESPN. You'll see some crazy, ridiculous things in ESPN that aren't part of the majors, the the major sports or even the minor sports. But you'll never see like you know Undertaker losing his very first match in WrestleMania after twenty one in a row, and he finally enough, lost it was one. Reported. Well, that that specific thing, <laughs> but I mean, in general, uh-huh. you won't see like you know this guy lost to this guy. The sure. championship belt was exchanged to this guy. It's just because they don't consider it a sport to report, right? right. And I, mean, I, and I think that's that kind of unfair un- since the fifties. Yeah, and I think that's hmm. kind of unfair because you know, the, like Anthony was saying, the physicality and the athleticism required to do it, I could never do it. That and yeah. I could never have my back land on the on the mat because it looks like canvas, but it's plywood. You yeah. in certain certain uh, venues when it's televised. Mm. And the sound mics, the mics are, are placed a certain way. You can hear the loud thrashing of that wood yeah. slamming on someone's back. And you can, if you really look for it, you can see a lot of accidents. You can see where a guy hit a guy incorrectly. And um, you can see someone landed a certain way, especially when stuff happens outside of the ring where, you know, that's where the real oh, yeah. melee occurs and stuff like that. And uh, And to me, I think at the end of the day, maybe where they're sort of stuck is not knowing what's the thing that's going to be compelling as far as storylines and who are our characters and now the bad guys are the good guys and we're right now we're in the age of the anti-hero all across the board yeah. movies anti-hero wrestling anti-hero sports anti-heroes i mean that's just the that's the thing Hot that first yeah i mean that's just the thing that's that's capturing everybody's imagination it's not cool to be good anymore it's not cool to be a nice guy anymore yeah. or whatever you gotta it's, blur those lines I, I think the thing that it seems like you know, for, for people that aren't already immersed in that or um, I think the thing that's tough is that I guess maybe why it doesn't get quite the respect maybe that it deserves is that other sports, what be it baseball or basketball or football or whatever, you know, even, you know, something like gymnastics or something like that is that, you know, that goes through periods where it's, you know, boring or entertaining or whatever. I mean, like, and, that, and that's highlights are kind of the essence of that you know most people mm-hmm. don't have time to sit around at three o'clock in the afternoon and watch a four-hour baseball game but you'll watch highlights of it or same thing with football or whatever else and i think it's because there's that and i don't know how you you know obviously transfer this to wrestling because it's, it's built on a different structure but the the fact that like we'd like to think that other professional american sports the the thing that's the variable thing is that you never know what's going to happen at the last minute. Is that somebody may be the underdog, somebody may be the team that's got the most hurt players, or that's having internal strife, or that you know whatever the situation is, but somehow they can still you know have gut check time and, and, and pull out a win. You know whether it's you know on the shoulders of their fans or you know coming from behind or whatever it is there's always that possibility and that's the thing i think that excites people the most whereas from you know again from an outsider's perspective with wrestling you don't if you don't or if, you're, if you're not already bought into that you know it's never going to happen right someone's mm-hmm. not going to go you know what fuck it i'm going off script man i'm going <laughs> to fucking kill you right fucking now because if that did happen that shit would be on espn like oh, oh yeah. guess what like some guy came out of the stands and, got and, real. and killed Ric Flair, like, <laughs> with a fucking, like, you know, with a shiv, you know? Like, that would be on everywhere because it would be unexpected. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Or throw an MMA fighter in it and Yeah, something say, like that. It's like, and it. I'm not saying that's what you should do, but I'm saying it's like, I think that's, you know, again. No, I, I mean, you're, you're, you're never going to you're never gonna be able to compete with the uncertainty of professional sports where there's a scored outcome you know yeah. wrestling matches aren't determined by who had this many points even even boxing uses that approach to determine someone that wasn't knocked out they score a card mm-hmm. and in wrestling you know it's you're either pinned you're disqualified or you submit in your in yeah. your match and or you perform some right. special task uh, that the match is predetermined and so because of that you know as an audience we're never going to be able to jump on board as much with um, not knowing what they know versus not knowing what nobody knows. Right. The outcome of a football or a basketball game, no one knows. The players don't even know what's going to happen, despite mm-hmm. what a lot of uneducated sports fans think. The refs don't know either. It's not fixed in the classical sense other than scandals that yeah. bring that stuff to life. The general norm is that nobody has any clue who's going to take what shot with the last second. And you know you can't fix yourself to make a shot you can't fix the ball being thrown 50 yards and yeah. caught by a guy with one hand off the top of his helmet you know you just yeah. can't script that kind of stuff yeah so yeah. with with wrestling i think like anthony was saying from the very get-go 
the whole point of it is the entertainment and the the fantasy part of you know we could never a look like those guys and i know that that's the ugly side of wrestling is Mm -hmm. that demand to look a certain way it would never be guys like us although sometimes now that's again getting back to that anti-hero thing now you're starting to see an influx of guys that aren't in perfect shape they've got a little bit of flab on their stomach Mm -hmm. and they're scruffy and they've got long hair and they look like uh you know mumford sons and now they're getting in the ring too but (laughs) but technically technically they're skilled wrestlers too like you know daniel bryan you know and um guys like that they're becoming they're bringing that whole countercultural thing to to the limelight as well but the general norm for the wrestlers is you have to have you know a certain amount of biceps and muscle yeah. this and that and of course that's led to and I know we're kind of kind of going long on this one but <laughs> that's led to the darker side of it of all these tragic deaths and steroid and yeah. drugs and depression and yeah. alcoholism and all these things that these poor guys who I don't know Anthony that's the thing I was curious about was mm-hmm. when you're not in the top tier is what kind of living do these guys make you know, being a part of this very demanding because the physicality required for these guys is more demanding in my opinion than your average athlete in a pro sport because they're, those guys are, they're not seasonal. It's all year, every year. And anytime you're not getting in the ring, you're not getting paid. Right. So the, the roster for the professional, like let's just, let's stick with WWF for the, you know, the, the, the basic example is, you know, if you're not Hulk Hogan or, the Undertaker or, the top tier. you know, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Scott Hall and Steve Austin, you know, what about all those other guys that are putting in that time and they're getting slammed and getting rocked every <laughs> night, you know, and just that someone left. getting destroyed, you know, getting their necks bent out of shape and, sure. you know, having to go to the doctor and all that stuff. I mean, what does that side look like? Well, in this case, um, that's a good question. I mean, great strides have been made, especially like since we're going to use WWE as the, as like what we're, the focal point is. Um, yeah, back in the 80s, it was like that. If you didn't work, you didn't get paid. Um, WWE and wrestling as a whole has treated workers as, as the courts would call it, independent contractors, meaning that you're responsible for yourself, even though, quite frankly, you are in the employee of the promoter. Mm-hmm. But that's a paradox for the courts. Anyways, um, yeah, you're right. In this particular case, if if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. And so it pushed people to... Uh, find ways to deal with the pain. So we we were talking about painkillers. We're talking about people not getting like you know they'll go see a doctor for a bum knee and they'll tell them, okay, well and you need you know two months of bed rest, no you know no nothing, and yeah. they're back on the road in two weeks because they got to work. Yeah. And so in this particular case, there's been great strides nowadays, uh, especially when it comes to the payment of of wrestlers. That nowadays they work more like a traditional. Uh, professional athlete. Like salary? Exactly. They have contracts. Hmm. In this particular case, the contracts now stipulate that they have a bunch of bonuses and incentives for being at major shows, drawing merchandise, drawing fans. But in the event that they're hurt, they do have the uh, what's called a downside guarantee. Downside guarantee basically means that if I'm not working, this is the bare minimum of what you can pay me. Uh, Again, back in the 80s and 90s, the, the contracts were egregious. Uh, you know, you could basically have a guarantee of work, basically guaranteeing you nine dates at a thousand dollars a pop, which is nothing. Wow! <laughs> and so, like, if you're not, if you're not working, you're basically looking at about nine thousand dollars. Good yeah. luck. Pretext. And the thing, exactly. And the thing is, is that uh, these wrestlers don't necessarily. I mean, while they now have a, a health plan with the WWE, uh, they used to not. They used to just be on their own. Uh, get your own health insurance. See your own doctors. Um, so this was, I mean, they make a lot of money again at the top side, but then again, when you're making that much money, you can afford these things. And like mm-hmm. you said, if you're not working, that's when it becomes really tough. So what, what kind of money are we talking about that these guys potential earnings? Are we talking like, you know, now tens of thousands a year or hundreds of thousands, millions? I mean, where is the, is it just all over the map? It, it all depends really where you are on the card. If you are like, let's talk like nowadays, if you're basically, um, at the main event level, if you're a featured player. Then in this particular case, you're talking about you know it's easy, uh, you know low six figures. You're looking at three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, and then that's just your base money. And, On and, the top of that, you're talking about yeah. merchandising rights and well, incentives. It's odd to me that uh, I asked that question because I wonder if that's kind of part of what maybe that sport is lacking is some of that transparency. Where I think 
I don't know if it's sadistic or not, but we want to know the ridiculous amount of money these guys are getting, or we want to know how unfairly they're being paid for their work because, yeah. you know, you can go and look up any salary mm-hmm. of any player in pro sports and you can look up what the coach makes and you can look up, you know, the breakdown of their, you know, asset sheets and all that stuff, the balance sheets of, of everything they've got going. And in wrestling, it's kind of a, it's kind of a secret thing. You really don't ever know, you know, did Hulk Hogan make, $10 million, $50 million, $100 million, or is he broke, you know, or, you know, I mean, we really, that's yeah. not a, that's not something you hear about. And even in boxing, it's like Floyd Mayweather is going to get $90 million for his match, you know, with the pay-per-view mixed in and all that. And I don't know if it's on purpose or not that the wrestling, that side of it, because everybody's yeah. sort of rabid for that information. Everyone wants to know like, oh, you know, Peyton Manning just signed a huge contract mm-hmm. with the Broncos for X amount of dollars. And I think they overpaid him. And that becomes a talking point. People like to talk about this guy being overpaid for this amount of, of, you know, talent or productivity and the, the side of wrestling, it's sort of an unknown. We don't know if these guys are poor guys, you know, that have to charge oh, $50, <laughs> $50 for an autograph at these like appearance shows because they're trying to get, you know, feed themselves for right. not being paid properly yeah. by Vince or whoever. The only reason, I mean, the only way you're going to see what they're what they're making right now is, if, funny enough, um, I've I've been privy to some of their, what they make because they'll have like a divorce settlement, <laughs> and so in that case, if it's public record, you can see what they make because yeah. now you're seeing that in in the in their docket. But aside from that, um, you're you're right. You don't see it, and as as long as it remains unregulated. There's no commissions to 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 oversee the contracts. The, the reason why you know Mayweather is making so much money is because if let's just say they're fighting in Las Vegas, the Nevada Boxing Commission has to have those numbers and they will release them. That's a matter of public record. Right. Hmm. In this particular case, uh, wrestling, uh, Vince McMahon actually in the early '90s, uh, like you said, he made those kinds of promos uh, and kind of take, took away the the idea that this is legitimate. He purposely did that so that, in this case, uh, states would stop regulating them. And so, in this case, if now you're just an entertainment venue, we don't have to tell you. Like what the way they were trying to regulate the quiz shows in the '50s, where exactly. they had people on those shows and they were feeding them the questions because yeah. they were mm-hmm. they looked a certain way and it was good for the the compelling. We'll make drama out of yeah, it. Yeah. And so they they actually appeared before the Senate hearing or whatever about those gaming shows back yeah, in the '50s or whatever. Yeah. And actually, that movie quiz show is kind of a cool dramatization with uh, Ralph Fiennes. But mm. before we jump out of the the wrestling segment, uh, just as a quick a quick fun thing, let's mm. go with like your top. Everyone go around and just do like your top three favorite guys that you know. <laughs> it might not you might even get to three if you guys don't have that many. But I think it'd just be kind of fun to put out there who your your top guys are uh, all time top three okay. wrestling guys. I mean, I'm gonna just completely. Uh... You know, uh, make myself a total wrestling geek, but I'll say uh, Bret Hart, um, and then these guys are Japanese. That's fine. So you guys won't even know them, but that's okay. Uh, I would say Jushin Thunder Liger and uh, Mitsuharu Misawa. But uh, if if you're listening to this, YouTube them, you'll understand why. Sweet. I would say actually, I completely agree um, with Anthony. One of them, my. My top guy was Mr. Perfect. That was just, he was too much fun not to have, you know, just an instant. I vaguely remember him. Yeah, he yeah. was fantastic. I I loved his moves in the ring. I loved his finishing move. Um, I was always about the finishing move. To me, that was kind of the cool thing. So Mr. Perfect always had the, the perfect plex. Um, Bret Hart was also, you know, one of my favorite guys. Everything that he went through with the conspiracy thing Rick was talking about, you know, where he was supposed to, you know, walk away from the, the company gracefully and then he got pinned and lost his title in a disgraceful way, you know, in, in, um, in his view and in all the fans view, but I always thought Bret Hart was, was a badass. So he was definitely my top one. And then of course, uh, the undertaker, you know, also because not, he wasn't always the best skilled wrestler, but undertaker for me was just as a kid. I mean, he just put that fear in you. You'd see him coming down the ring. And you're like, man, there's this dark guy. He, he's, he's an undertaker and he <laughs> makes coffins and he's going to put his opponent in the hurt. coffin. You know, he never gets heard. And did he take you know, measurements he, before? He, he, you know, it was funny because a, a, a lot of, a lot of the promos for before his matches, he'd be there with his manager, Paul bear, and he'd have an urn in his hand. <laughs> that guy died. And, yeah, Paul he did, bear. unfortunately. Yes. And, um, <laughs> I know. And uh, in the promos, Undertaker would be, you know, literally with like a wood saw or something like he'd be sanding the coffin that's oh, going to be, you know, yeah, in a yeah, workshop, you know. And, oh, it was just – it was incredible. I mean, for me, I think like wrestling will never top that late 80s, early 90s. And then, of course, during the WCW 
WWE wars with the NWO and all that stuff. I think for me that was just the end all be all time. So those are my those are my top three guys. I got to say, uh, I like I said earlier, I, I really only remember like Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan. I, I think Andre the Giant just because the guy was just really literally a giant. Right. Mm-hmm. I think just that idea. But I mean, that's the same way I feel about like basketball, about like just the the outliers like uh, Spud Webb, you know, or, or uh, Muggsy Bogues. Same thing with Andre the Giant. And I'm really, he's I think he's. Been so you're the... a George Mearson fan. Hmm. <laughs> I'm just playing. Oh my god. That's like usually like seven foot six. Something like that. Holy crap. <laughs> Jeez, and he's in basketball. Basketball, he was, was very briefly. Okay. Did he die? I think so. He was murdered. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. <laughs> oh god, that's too dead. I know Lord. he was in my giant with Billy Crystal. Oh, that guy. Yeah, he is not a Duma. That was. <laughs> <Yeah. Lord's laughs> I know, but that's what that's what got him. <laughs> oh, okay. It was the giant. <laughs> well, that's the Paul we've had on this conversation, Rick. Uh, Coco Beware. <laughs> <laughs> Coco Beware, Big Boss Man. Oh, that's nice. And Superfly Jimmy Snook. There you go. There you go. Mm. Wow. And the Bushwalker. Bushwhackers. The bush- that's bush- the one. <laughs> <laughs> the Herbert the bush- George Bushwhackers. <laughs> the Bushweisers. H.W. <laughs> Bushwhackers. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, we're at, we're at 46 minutes. I don't know if we want to just... I was going to say, do you want to... Uh, I was going to say... Um, Someday we'll we'll get to the end of the Montreal screw job because we never got to the end of that. <laughs> well, let's well, let's use that as our closer. Fini- let's, finish, let's finish out the finish Montreal screw job. Yeah, okay. for all those listening, and that the Montreal that, that keep... blow job. <laughs> uh, there, there were several of those that, uh, but they're not on record. We can't talk about them. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, in this case, uh, what happened was is that um, the aforementioned Bret Hart, uh, he again was on a tear for about five years, uh, always being the top guy. And eventually, uh, WCW was able to the, – the rival company was able to court him and get him in for a ton of money. Well, uh, he didn't want to uh, – he basically had some major matches that were supposed to occur in Canada. And he he was a, he's a Canadian hero, or at least he considers himself that. And the, the fans <laughs> do also. He's – I mean he's basically up like there. Like Shia LaBeouf. Oh, no one <laughs> likes him. Like Justin Bieber. Uh, I think like, Canada wants to get rid of him, doesn't it? They want to send him like oh, Bermuda. Wow. <laughs> um, but in this case, uh, what happened was is that um, he specifically didn't want to lose in Canada and was being particularly um, disagreeable when it came to how to drop the belt, meaning how to lose the title. Yeah. And so in this case, uh, he was going to be uh, rid of his contractual obligations with WWE at the end of a particular pay-per-view. Um, for those of you who want to take a look at it, uh, 1997 Survivor Series. That's what the Montreal screw job where it, where it occurred. Um, they had told him that, okay, well, we're going to make an arrangement for you to lose the title. You'll just drop the title, uh, meaning you're just going to surrender it, after the match. And you're going to go on your way to WCW. But the thing was, is that, they uh, again, these two particular companies were at war. And the hatred between each other, particularly Vince McMahon uh, for Eric Bischoff, who was the leader of WCW, he hated him so, and he didn't trust him at all, which, of course, he wouldn't. But in this particular case... He decided to double cross Brett in the middle of his match um, where there was supposed to be a scripted area where, again, a lot of high tension in this one move. Uh, they specifically had Shawn Michaels, the opponent at the time, uh, put him uh, put Brett Hart in uh, a move called the sharpshooter, which is Brett Hart's finishing move. It's basically a submission move. Well, he basically put him in the beginning of that hold, and as he turned him over, uh, Vince McMahon... Um, Basically, was over there having the bell rung. The referee spe- uh, specifically went over the bell, which out well, without having even Bret Hart tap or acquiesce or submit or anything. They just went straight to finishing the match right there and then, without any motions happening. Um, Shawn Michaels at the time had denied that he had anything to do with it, but of course later he found we found out he did. Hmm. Uh, everyone did because they were there. At, from Brit's perspective, they felt he felt that they had screwed him. They they welched on a on a deal that they had made. From the WWE's perspective uh, and those involved, they were protecting the belt from going to the the rivals because that was a possibility. Anyways, this particular uh, thing basically set off Britt, and he didn't speak to WWE for over ten years. And um, you know that's considered one of the biggest double crosses because no one knew about it except for a handful of people. 
And if you, hmm. you, you said uh, uh, something about, like, um, we love it when no one knows and that at the yeah. end of it all, something crazy happens. That's when it happened. Ah, There's a, okay. And there was a documentary on this whole thing, right, Anthony? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Wrestling with Shadows. Wrestling with Shadows. Then mm-hmm. That's actually a really badass uh, documentary to watch on this and also – on Bret Hart's father, Stu Hart, who ran like this hardcore, like guys who were like young guys who were in physically fit shape. They'd be like, Oh, I want to be a professional wrestler. I'm going to, I'm going to show you my stuff. And Stu Hart's like this super old curmudgeonly man. And he had this little dungeon, uh, in his, in their house in Canada in uh, Calgary. Yeah. And, um, that he would, the, the documentary shows him taking these young guys down there. They're, they're like ripped guys and like, all right, show me some of the stuff. And he'd put them in a movie and you see these guys like screaming, like, <laughs> He's like, how do you like that? How's that feeling? He's like, I'm sorry, <laughs> sir. Like, oh, it's wow. incredible. Like, I mean, just and that he's harkens so, back to the old hooker thing. Like, he's so skilled, he's this yeah. old man, old man who can just put you in a little move, and you're just whimpering in in pain. It's a great uh, documentary, Wrestling with Shadows. But, Definitely check that out. Is that on for, Netflix? Uh, it was a lot when I watched it. It was. I don't oh, know if okay. it is anymore. You could do that. Another one, if you want to check it out. This is kind of a time capsule from the ni- late 1990s, uh, but it was a great documentary at the time. I still recommend it. It's called Beyond the Mat. Uh, okay, that one yeah. is definitely oh, yeah, on one. Netflix if you want to check that out. That's yeah, a great right. one. Uh, that one actually kind of talks about how Michael was talking about um, a different uh, – the spectrums of, of different wrestlers, people at the top, people at the bottom, uh, people who are just starting, and people who unfortunately are has-beens and how they're trying to get around. And you know, it's um, – in some respects, it's very nice, and in other uh, times, the documentary can get really stark. Mm-hmm. And um, it's it's a it's a really good one. I recommend it. Um, <clears throat> outside of that, uh, what else is there? <laughs> what, what's your uh, so before we go? What's your favorite fictional wrestling movie? F- oh God, wow. they're all terrible. <laughs> uh, if I have to choose the least worst, I'm going to go with No Holds Barred. Nice with Zeus. Yeah, and Rick's going to say the wrestler. It's so dramatic. I still yeah. haven't seen that. I want to. The wrestler's Aww. good. Um, I didn't even think about that actually. Uh, when you said fictional, like, yeah, I'm I thought the wrestler go with was something awesome. Hokey. It actually was. I, I liked it a lot. I did too. There you go. And I it proved Marissa that Marissa Tomei is <laughs> exactly. still stunning. Oh, she is hot. She's she's yeah, she's one of my favorites. She can be my valet anytime. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. Let's discuss valet real quick, just for definition purposes, because we mentioned this earlier. Common terms: Common valet, terms. heel, jobber. Uh, valet is basically uh, a female who escorts the wrestler to the ring. They're like Miss Elizabeth. Serving. Exactly. That's did she die? Archetyp- yes. Oh, God, God, everybody she dies. Did? God, yeah, what? everybody in the new everybody did you know that? Died. No, man. She died. Damn, that's gosh, heartbreaking, man. I didn't ten know. Ten years ago. Oh, that's she got awful. trampled by what happened? escaped elephants um, from the zoo. She, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she died of a drug overdose, oh, unfortunately. Oh, oh Sharon Stone. And, uh, funny enough, uh, yeah, hot dirt. <laughs> funny enough. You're like, funny enough. No, no. It was funny enough. Unfortunately, yeah, the the people from the 80s are going away all too fast. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's a valet. Um, yeah, Miss Elizabeth is an archetypical uh, valet. Uh, what were the other ones? I said uh, heel. Heel. Heel's just a bad guy. Bad guy. Uh-huh. Face, okay. good guy. Good guy. And then we said earlier, Jobber's the guy who's, like, just in there to get They're his They're going ass to lose. Yeah. He's, he's a red shirt. Lose. So yeah, the, the, exactly. the glass Joes. How about the Tickle Monster? What, is, what does he do? Tickle Monster. <laughs> That's just something that you and I are supposed to talk about when oh. we're alone. Oh, whoa, whoa. Hit stop. Hit stop. Right, well, let, let's let you guys get to that then. <laughs> if you guys have any input on wrestling or any views that you want to share with us, let us know. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Vine, pretty much anywhere. Just look up It's a Guy Podcast or you can visit our website, www.itsaguythingpodcast.com. Thank you, Anthony, for being here. It was awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot. Was oh, I learned a lot today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Badass. Take care. You can visit us on our Today's podcast has been brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com slash 210 local music. Over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. 